Did you know there are almost no cuts, like camera cuts, over the entire length of Dead Space 2? That's actually not quite true. There are a couple times Isaac gets knocked out in the game's many hours and once he's thrown through a wall. But other than those diegetic breaks in the action, the whole dang thing is one continuous shot in dark station hallways and hallucinations and the vacuum of space. There are, in fact, sequences in which you're pulled through all of these environments in the span of minutes or even seconds, scrambling through a mix of rubble and zero-g and nightmarish creatures. It is wildly impressive. Seven years later, God of War for the PS4 would coordinate an entire marketing campaign around how its game had no cuts, how it was absolutely necessary for the story and really pulled you into the character and sold the journey, and then you start playing the game and surprise, you gotta pause every 40 seconds and get pulled into a completely separate screen to inspect your new piece of daddy armor. Dead Space 2 completely works around this issue. Everything, your HUD, your inventory, your map, is in-universe and contained within one continuous camera shot. Characters video call you on a little pop-up that projects out of your suit. Even the storefront is a holographic display that unfolds in front of you. I think about Dead Space 2's camera a lot because it serves as a neat little microcosm for how the game lives in my mind, even a full decade after its release. Seamlessly and without a big fuss, it pulls off a magic trick that I just haven't seen matched since. Look, this is just a video about how much I like Dead Space 2, okay? It'd be an uphill battle to claim that Dead Space 2 is a better pure horror game than its predecessor, and I'm not even going to try. Dead Space 1 is a masterpiece of genre game making. For instance, the locale of the first title is the USG Ishimura, a planet-cracking spaceship that protagonist Isaac Clarke explores every inch of. The engine rooms, the asteroid-blasted hull, the bathrooms. I remember reading the Game Informer review of it where Andrew Reiner wrote that he, quote, wouldn't be surprised if the ship was modeled to be fully functional. I love that line. To an even higher degree than the blue collar space world of Alien, everything in Dead Space feels functional. The suit that you wear is clunky and slow and looks like it weighs hundreds of pounds. You punch and stomp with the desperation of a guy out of his depth, not a trained killer. Dead Space also unfurls its horror slowly. Although you'll be running from monsters in the first couple minutes, the psychological transgressions that make up its most memorable plot points only seep in many hours later. It feels a little silly to say this about a game in which you blast off limbs with a modified mining tool, but Dead Space is classy. It's refined. It's like the chef's choice at a restaurant, each ingredient chosen deliberately and rationed appropriately. Dead Space 2 is the whole fucking menu. Now, the comparison that's so obvious I'm loath to even make it is the classic Alien movie progression. Ridley Scott's Alien is slow and often understated and the whole thing is about like one alien. And then James Cameron's sequel is... Get him! And this is often how horror sequels go, given bigger budgets and reaching for broader audiences. And Dead Space 2 is definitely that. But as much Alien-style bombast as it has, there's also the spooky catwalks and creeping dread of Alien, and hell, it even has the equivalent of the Caesarean scene from Prometheus. I told you, it's a whole fucking menu. Let's start with the environment. As I said, Dead Space 1 is confined to a single ship. A very big ship, granted, but just one. Like Reiner said in that review, the ship is immaculately constructed, with all the giant machinery and little corridors that you'd expect from a glorified mining rig. However, maybe the gamiest part of Dead Space 1 was how segmented everything was. You get on a little tram car, ride to a level, do everything in that level, and then leave on another little tram car. While perfectly fine for a game divided into chapters, it gives it a fairly predictable pace. 
But Dead Space 2 takes place all over this residential colony called The Sprawl, a place way bigger and way more varied than the ship of the first game. And partially due to its commitment to keeping everything in one continuous shot, travel between each location becomes just as important as the location itself. In fact, it becomes my favorite part of the game. For instance, early on, you're on your way somewhere, and so, just like Dead Space 1, you step on a train. But this time, clearly in response to our expectations, the train starts moving, and there's no fade to black. We stay on it. Predictably, all sorts of monsters start crashing through the train windows almost immediately. Less predictably, opening the door to the next car reveals that there's, uh, no next car. And so our significantly more agile than in the previous game protagonist jumps into the air and rockets towards the front of the train, a seconds long sequence that still includes dodging flying debris and a seriously compelling depiction of speed. And then, just when you think you're back on stable train, the whole thing goes off the rails, ending with you hanging upside down, disorientedly shooting at dudes, and then having the whole damn car go smashing down behind you. This really isn't that different from an Uncharted sequence or something. Look, everyone loves trains. If I put a different musical track under this, I could fool you into thinking it's a completely different genre. But the fine line that Dead Space 2 walks, the reason I think sequences like this work so well, is that it holds on to the tension, the vulnerability of a horror game. There's no music in this sequence, by the way. It is solely screeching metal and heavy breathing and the low thrums of an enormous station. You don't get to jump on a turret and shoot down a helicopter as the finale. You're hung from your foot while monsters breathe down your neck. And I point this out just to be cheeky, you did this two years before The Last of Us did the same thing. This isn't my favorite set piece of the game. It's not even in the top three, more on that later, but the train is, I think, a very good example of what Dead Space 2 is and isn't doing within its genre. The focus of the horror here isn't scares per se. I would not say I was frightened while doing any of this, but even within these bombastic segments, what it preserves is the survival part of survival horror. Getting swiped by the flailing arm of a necromorph means using a health pack, and you might only have two of those, and who the hell knows what's going to be through the next door. Even with the heightened action of Dead Space 2, resource scarcity is a constant. And this brings us to the core gameplay loop, which is also the reason I can't stay away from this thing. Dead Space 2 understands the paradoxical logic that a shooting game, especially one that still maintains a tight ammo economy, can actually be made significantly more fun by giving options other than shooting. A huge part of why Resident Evil 4 is so fun to play oh, shit. Here we go again. is that you can dispatch a guy by shooting him six times, or you can take out the same guy by shooting him once, running up, kicking him over, and then smacking him while he's on the ground. When the high-level gameplay loop encourages you to preserve your bullets, it feels delightfully like you're outsmarting the game by finding ways other than bullets to knock enemies out. Dead Space 2 does not have an acrobatic kick or a suplex, tragically, but what it does have is essentially a main character with telekinesis. With your TK module, you can pick up and throw objects around the environment. The usefulness of this should be immediately apparent. Instead of using one of your 12 plasma cutter rounds, you can instead pick up a gas canister and hurl it at a dude. This gets even better though, when you realize that every enemy in the game is essentially made of spiky bits, and those spiky bits are just waiting to get reduce, reuse, recycled. So when you see a necromorph with razor sharp arms charging at you, you can shoot off one of those arms, pick it up with telekinesis, and throw it back at him, impaling him to a wall. Then, if you're really committed to sustainability, you can pull off his other arm, turn around, and throw it at the other guy who just burst through a vent. This mechanic was technically also present in Dead Space 1, but as is the case with these two titles, in a slower, clunkier, less flexible form. In Dead Space 1, it was like a little bonus if you managed to play all your cards exactly right. In Dead Space 2, it's one of your primary modes of combat. If you want to make it through, you need to forcefully return limbs to their original owners. The difference between the two games highlighted again, does being empowered make the game scarier? 
No, it does not. Does it make it more fun? Oh, buddy. Yes, it does. And as evidenced by how deranged I probably sounded describing ripping the limbs off one monster to impale another with, I think this gameplay still works for the particular tone of horror that Dead Space 2 is going for. We're watching the hero prevail in a truly grotesque way, make horrifying decisions that are necessitated by the situation he finds himself in. Dead Space 2 isn't quite full evil dead, but there is a bizarre mix of glee and disgust that comes from slowing down a necromorph, planting a mine under their feet, and watching all of their limbs fly off in different directions. The particular brand of violence that makes this game so viscerally satisfying to play would feel disproportionately gross in a non-horror environment. Another symptom of not quite scary, but definitely still horror that runs through the combat is just a general air of desperation. One of the cooler moves you can pull off is shooting out a window in the space station, instantly depressurizing the room and sucking everything out into space, including you, unless you're quick enough to hit the button to seal off the room again. This is similar to the old dismemberment telekinesis trick in that it's a clever way to save ammunition, and it's also similar in that it's conceptually terrifying. Shooting out the window is a ludicrous move, made only reasonable by just how hopeless your situation is. That desperation extends further than the minute-to-minute -minute combat, too. As I hinted at before, all the excitement of the train sequence doesn't hold a candle to my favorite set piece of the game, the Halo Jump. To give you the briefest possible story set up here, our main character, Isaac Clark, is trying to survive with two other people he met on the station. Isaac, the ever-eager engineer, went to fix some solar panel array on the other side of the station, but while you're there, you get a terrified call from one of the other survivors. Those things are still heading towards the transport hub. They're wrecking everything in their path. Holy shit, they'll cut us off. Get to the hub! I'll meet you as soon as I can! I really like this beat. Fixing a solar array isn't particularly stressful on its own, but that call adds a whole new layer of anxiety. Even if you're fine, you have to go as fast as you can because other people might not be. But it's what happens next, a ludicrous move in a hopeless situation, that I've been thinking about for years. You charge back through the airlock, get one more despairing call. You'll never make it down here in I'll time. I'll be there. I'll be there and then throw yourself into an ejector seat, which in one continuous shot, fastens you in, rotates, and catapults you into the vacuum. Every time I return to Dead Space 2, I worry that this scene won't hold up to the absolute pinnacle I've placed it on, and every time, it still outdoes my expectations. Where do we even start? Okay, so as I mentioned before, this game takes place almost entirely on a colony called The Sprawl. And while you go through a lot of interiors, it's hard to get a sense of what the entire place looks like until now. It starts as an abstract shape, just a semicircle, and it's hard to get a handle on the scale. Getting closer, you start to recognize each texture as full, huge buildings, each square as massive city-sized sections, and you get even closer and realize that any single block here is big enough to contain the entire game, and then you get so close, you're smashing through pipes and tunnels and finally manage to ignite your boots for a pretty sweet superhero landing. It's also, for the most part, not a cutscene or a quick time event. You are in control of Isaac's flight here, and although there's not much to do other than scream forward through space, the obstacles they throw in your way are visually striking enough that you forgive the relatively limited interactivity. I think it would have been easy to give you space junk, big rocks and nondescript metal to avoid. That is not what Dead Space 2 does. Instead, each thing that you dodge past feels impossibly detailed. A ship with fading paint and a visible airlock, a fractured corridor that looks like one you've walked through before, and then the peak of the whole 30 seconds, a piece of infrastructure so massive that it blocks out the entire sprawl, so massive it seems like you are inevitably going to smash directly into it, until right in the middle, an internal hallway shows itself for just long enough that you can dart through it. It is breathtaking stuff. 
On that note, even the sound design is phenomenal. Dead Space has really nailed how to make space feel silent, but still cinematic. The scene starts with absolutely nothing, not even a rocket blast from our suit, and then the first sounds are just the bassy rumblings of objects blowing past us, so deep that they're not meant to be heard so much as felt. And then Isaac's jagged breathing is layered on top, and then muffled sounds of our own boosters going off, and all of those just get gradually louder until towards the end, a screeching horror orchestra breaks through for just a second, and then just crashing and smashing and breaking stuff, and then landing. Whew. A decade later, this still blows me away. It is a technical and tonal masterpiece. Later in Dead Space 2, there actually, want to know something else about the Halo jump? I remember when Star Trek Into Darkness came out two years later, and it had a scene almost conceptually identical to this one. And guess what? That movie cost $190 million, and their space jump wasn't half as dramatically tense or visually interesting. It really goes to show that there's so much more that goes into making a moment like this memorable than simple tech horsepower. There's just so much dang craft in Dead Space, so much care put into every little detail. Man, do I love that Halo jump. There's an interesting dichotomy between my favorite Dead Space 2 moment, that jump, and my favorite level. Because I think there's pretty broad consensus that the best level in Dead Space 2 is also the quietest, and the one that's most removed from the game's bombast. In fact, it's one in which you almost literally revisit the first game, the return to the USG Ishimura. The plot reason Isaac has to come back to his old haunts is laughably arbitrary, something something gravity tethers, it's not super important. What matters is that this is the return to the nightmare that's been stalking us throughout the entire game, the origin of the trauma, the reason there are monsters. I've talked about how different Dead Space 1 and 2 are, but what makes them feel holistic is the respect that the sequel pays to the first game. There has been no moving on, no forgetting of the events that started the sequence of catastrophes off. To have the Ishimura docked here, to have to walk its halls once again, is a manifestation of what's never been in question. Isaac can't shake himself of this place. And for the first achingly long minutes, there's nothing. None of the buttery smooth combat or grotesque creative delimbing decisions, just a nerve-wracking walk through the haunted house of Isaac's past. When monsters eventually break into here too, it's almost a relief. The fact that Dead Space 2 can pull off both the Halo jump and the return to the Ishimura within hours of each other speaks to the seemingly impossible tightrope this game walks. It is a roller coastering action game with deeply satisfying combat and creative encounter design, and a sometimes cheesy but often very effective horror story, all wrapped up in viscera and genius level UI design. It is eating the entire menu and finding out that somehow every flavor works in harmony with every other. It is in many ways the sequel to Resident Evil 4 I always wanted, and even though I've played great horror games and great action games in more recent years, still delivers something I haven't been able to get a hold of since. Oh, y'all thought I was gonna end this video without talking about the eyeball scene, huh? The best scene of Dead Space 2 is the Halo jump, and the best level is the Ishimura, but the single most enduring, most unforgettable part of this game is the culmination of a nursery rhyme. It's a moment that's been subtly foreshadowed since almost the very beginning, but even though the game has been telling you what it's going to ask you to do, it might not be until you're well into this machine that you put it all together. Cross your heart and hope to die. Stick a needle in your eye. I don't think I've ever wanted to not do something in a video game more than I did not want to do this. In an interview with Polygon about the scene, creative director Wright Bagwell said that he wanted the player to discover what they were going to do at the same time that they figured out how the minigame worked, and that's exactly what happened to me. I remember playing this at 2am in the dark, 
realizing that the light turned blue when the needle was directly over his pupil and just freezing. I kept hoping a cutscene would kick in, take control away from me, but it does not. As the needle gets closer and closer, Isaac gets more panicked. His eye starts moving around more erratically, making it even harder to keep everything aligned. The first time alone at 2 a.m., I botched it. I'm not sure if I got too shaky or Isaac looked to the side unexpectedly, but what I do know is the fail state to this scene is maybe the only time playing a game that I've involuntarily covered my eyes and mouth with my hands in some kind of vain attempt to shield myself from the thing I already saw. Right, Bagwell actually said the same thing. I could barely watch it. I remember everyone in the room was still cringing. I can't believe how much else there is in this game I want to talk about. The improbably beautiful vent design, the ending subversion, the, the preschool. Ultimately, the boring answer to why this game is so damn good is that it's just paced impeccably. There are so many moments that stand out as good and virtually none that stand out as bad because the game so effortlessly guides you from one peak to another. I mean, I didn't even mention the in-universe nav guide so you never get lost, or, or how about the scene where both you and a giant monster get sucked out into space and smack into a gunship? What about the foam finger weapon you unlock for beating the hardest difficulty level, or maybe the goriest opening scene of all time, or the part where you open- This video was sponsored by Morning Brew. Much like Isaac Clarke, I like to wake up and immediately punish myself. I open my eyes, reach over, grab my phone, and download some truly terrible takes into my brain. I don't think the phone part is going away, I still need the chance to kind of slowly bring myself to life, but I think there are significantly better ways I could introduce myself to the world, and at least one of those is Morning Brew, a completely free daily newsletter built to just get you going on the day's events in a more, let's say, tempered way than the rest of the internet. Look, now I can get up and read about new antitrust legislation, or the cancelled Keystone Pipeline, or even do a crossword. It is a chiller and more informative way to return to this mortal coil each morning. And then, once I'm through that, I can switch back to Twitter, and you can sign up to Morning Brew right now. There's no introductory trial period or reduced rate, it's just free. You're not even trusting them with your credit card info or something. There's a link in the video description. Just follow that. Start, start brewing up your morning. Uh, that's that's my catchphrase, not theirs. Uh, they probably have something better. Morning brew. Also, what about that scene where a giant tentacle comes out and grabs you just like the first game and that turns out to be a hallucination or the fact that there are babies, like literal babies as enemies in this game and also like feral children as well. And how messed up is it that it's a legitimate combat tactic to throw the babies at the children because it turns out the babies explode, huh? This game also has a real grasp on lighting. It's super dramatic and lens flurry in sections, but it can also be pretty subtle or just pitch black. I love the UV lighting and the Ishimura level that just shows everything everything absolutely smeared with blood and a gristle, and it will also do that flashing light thing that just incites immediate panic. Speaking of panic, how did I not bring up the hunters? How freaking tense are they just walking through an area and knowing there are things in every corner watching you, and then you hear that scream? There's an ultra hard difficulty level I've never done, but I've always been curious about in this game, where you literally only get three saves for the entire game, and you have to decide how to portion them out over the runtime. How cool is that? Also, I will not be talking about Dead Space 3, so don't ask me about it. It's simply not an interesting topic. Why would I talk about something bad when I could talk about something good? And what's good is the way in the final level, a bad guy literally shoots you through your hand, like impales your hand, and you just like look at it, and then you have to pull it out, and then you pull his gun away from him and, and shoot him in the head, and it just, it just explodes. It's so gross. 